Welcome to the God's Peculiar People podcast, where we learn about the lives and characteristics of God's people. Welcome back to the God's Peculiar People podcast. Today we have some exciting news to share with you. Over the past two years, we've created two different audiobooks. One was about Mary Slusser, and one was about D.L. Moody. We started with Mary Slusser because we could not find an audiobook version of her story, and we thought, why not make one? We've gotten a lot of good response again this summer, and so we've decided to create a separate YouTube channel, and in the future a podcast channel, called Words of the Past, where we will be putting all of that content. Most of the content will be recorded by myself, but some of it will be recorded by other people. There is a place called LibriVox where you are able to access books that have already been read and are put in the public domain, so some of those books will be used on the channel. Now, if you have a suggestion of a book that you cannot find anywhere recorded, and it is prior to 1922, let us know, and we'll add it to the list of books to record. But we wanted to share with you a recording about the life of David Brainerd that is playing now on the Words of the Past YouTube channel. If you have any questions or comments, please let us know. But now, enjoy the life of David Brainerd, Chapter 1. Dive with us into the fascinating world of biographies, histories, and speeches as we learn from the words of the past. Chapter 1 of The Life of David Brainerd by John Stiles. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 1. His birth, his early concern about religion, the peculiar exercises of his mind, his desire to become a student for the ministry. Various are the methods which wise and good men have employed in defense of Christianity. The infidel has been assailed by a body of evidence which nothing but determined hostility to the Christian cause could enable him to resist. One champion has chosen this weapon, another has preferred that. Each has been excellent of its kind, and with respect to its particular object, has vanquished the ignorance of foolish men. But the vital influence of divine principles on the heart and life of a real Christian is with me an argument of matchless power which defends not a fact or individual circumstance only, but which is an adamantine shield to the entire system. It protects not merely a single entrance, it renders on every side the citadel secure. In this view, the life of David Brainerd, the missionary of the cross, has always appeared to me to contain the most luminous proofs of the divine reality and incalculable worth of the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This distinguished man, an apostle in labors and in infirmities, was a descendant of pious and respectable parents. He was born at Haddam in Connecticut, one of the American colonies, on April 20, 1718. From his earliest youth he was remarkably serious and thoughtful. His natural constitution was tinctured with melancholy, which notwithstanding the power and influence of Christianity in his heart, often embittered his life, and covered his mind with a veil of doubt and gloom. Against this natural infirmity he had to struggle to his dying day, and when this is considered, his abundant labors, indefatigable application, and ardent zeal are indeed surprising. They forcibly illustrate the truth of the divine promise, quote, My strength is made perfect in weakness, end quote. It does not appear that this excellent man was, by his parents, designed for the work of the ministry. The pursuits of husbandry occupied his attention, and he labored with his hands for one year upon his own farm at Durham. But the employment of a farmer was not congenial with his disposition. His mind thirsted for intellectual improvement, and at the age of twenty he commenced a life of study, attending at the same time with the greatest punctuality to the duties of religion in the performance of which he thought a minister, and a candidate for the ministerial office, should be remarkably strict. And it were to be wished that all who assume the sacred character felt thus concerned to maintain its real dignity. Perhaps no person ever presented a more striking instance of the subtlety and influence of a self-righteous spirit, and the bondage and misery into which it brings the soul, than David Brainerd. Numerous and painful were his struggles with this adversary. This was the canker worm at the root of all his religion, and long did he retain, quote, a secret latent hope of recommending himself to God by his religious duties. It was no easy thing to sweep away this refuge of lies. His heart clung to it till he had been nearly involved in its ruins. 
like a drowning creature yet disdaining to accept any offer of assistance he made every effort to reach the shore in his own strength and it was not until he was wearied in the greatness of his way till his own weakness and entire helplessness stared him in the face and pressed upon him on every side that he could say there is no hope save lord or i perish End quote. the account which he has himself given of the manner in which he was brought to acquiescence with all his heart in the gospel method of salvation and the mental difficulties with which he struggled previous to this is striking and affecting i was i think from my youth something sober and inclined to melancholy but do not remember any conviction of sin worthy of remark until i was seven or eight years of age when i grew terrified at the thoughts of death and was driven to the performance of duties this religious concern was short-lived however i sometimes attended secret prayer and thus lived at ease in zion though without god in the world till i was above thirteen years of age but in the winter seventeen thirty two i was something roused by the prevailing of a mortal sickness in haddam i was frequent constant and something fervent in duties and took delight in reading especially mr janeway's token for children i was sometimes much melted in duties and took great delight in the performance of them the spirit of god at this time proceeded far with me i was remarkably dead to the world and my thoughts were almost wholly employed about my soul's concerns i may indeed say almost i was persuaded to be a christian i was also exceedingly distressed at the death of my mother in march seventeen thirty two but afterwards my religious concern declined and i by degrees fell back into security though i still attended to secret prayer about the fifteenth of april seventeen thirty three i removed from my father's house to east haddam where i spent four years here i went in a round of secret duty i was not much addicted to young company but when i did go into it i never returned with so good a conscience as i went it always added new guilt to me and made me afraid to come to the throne of grace about the latter end of april seventeen thirty seven being full nineteen i removed to durham and began to work on my farm and so continued till i was twenty years old though frequently longing after a liberal education when i was about twenty i applied myself to study and was engaged more than ever in the duties of religion i became very watchful over my thoughts words and actions and thought i must be so because i designed to devote myself to the ministry some time in april seventeen thirty eight i went to mr fisk's and lived with him during his life and i remember he advised me wholly to abandon young company and associate myself with grave elderly people which counsel i followed and my manner of life was now exceeding regular i read my bible more than twice through in less than a year i spent much time every day in secret prayer and other secret duties i gave great attention to the word preached and endeavored to my utmost to retain it so much concerned was i about religion that i agreed with some young persons to meet privately on sabbath evenings for religious exercises and after our meeting was ended i used to repeat the discourses of the day to myself and recollect that i could though sometimes it was late in the night again on monday mornings i used sometimes to recollect the same sermons and i had sometimes considerable movings of affections in duties and much pleasure therein after mr fisk's death i proceeded in my learning with my brother and was still very constant in religious duties thus i proceeded on a self-righteous foundation and should still had not the mere mercy of god prevented sometime in the beginning of winter seventeen thirty eight it pleased god on one sabbath day morning as i was walking out for some secret duties to give me on a sudden such a sense of my danger and the wrath of god that i stood amazed and was much distressed all that day fearing the vengeance of god would soon overtake me i kept much alone and sometimes grudged the birds and beasts their happiness because they were not exposed to eternal misery as i saw i was and thus i lived from day to day in great distress sometimes there appeared mountains before me to obstruct my hopes of mercy but i used however to pray and cry to god and perform other duties with great earnestness 
Sometime in February 1738-9, I set apart a day for secret fasting and prayer, and spent the day in almost incessant cries to God for mercy, that he would open my eyes to see the evil of sin and the way of life by Jesus Christ. And God was pleased that day to make considerable discoveries of my heart to me, and to make my endeavors a means to show me my helplessness in some measure. I constantly strove after whatever qualifications I imagined others obtained before the reception of Christ. Sometimes I felt the power of an hard heart, and supposed it must be softened before Christ would accept of me, and when I felt any meltings of heart, I hoped now the work was almost done, and hence, when my distress still remained, I was wont to murmur at God's dealings with me, and thought, when others felt their hearts softened, God showed them mercy, but my distress remained still. Sometimes I grew remiss and sluggish without any great convictions of sin for a considerable time together, but after such a season convictions seized me more violently. One night in particular, when I was walking solitarily abroad, I had such a view of my sin that I feared the ground would cleave asunder and send my soul quick into hell. And though I was forced to go to bed, lest my distress should be discovered by others, which I much feared, yet I scarce durst sleep at all, for I thought it would be a great wonder if I should be out of hell in the morning. But though my distress was thus great, yet I dreaded the loss of convictions and returning back to a state of security, and to my former insensibility of impending wrath, which made me exceedingly exact in my behavior, lest I should stifle the motions of God's spirit. The many disappointments of distresses I met with put me into a most horrible frame of contesting with the Almighty, with an inward vehemence, finding fault with his ways of dealing with mankind. I found great fault with the imputation of Adam's sin to his posterity, and my wicked heart often wished for some other way of salvation than by Jesus Christ. I wished sometimes there was no God, or that there were some other God that could control him. These thoughts were frequently acted before I was aware, but when I considered this, it distressed me to think that my heart was so full of enmity against God, and it made me tremble lest God's vengeance should suddenly fall upon me. I used before to imagine my heart was not so bad as the scriptures represented. Sometimes I used to take much pains to work it into a humble, submissive disposition, but on a sudden the thoughts of the strictness of the law, or the sovereignty of God, would so irritate the corruptions of my heart, that it would break over all bounds and burst forth on all sides, like floods of waters when they break down their dam. While I was in this distressed state of mind, the corruption of my heart was especially irritated with these things following. 1. The strictness of the divine law. For I found it was impossible for me, after my utmost pains, to answer the demands of it. I often made resolutions, and as often broke them. I imputed the whole to want of being more watchful, and used to call myself a fool for my negligence. But when upon a stronger resolution, and greater endeavors, fasting and prayer, I found all attempts fail, then I quarreled with the law of God as unreasonably rigid. I thought, if it extended only to my outward actions I could bear with it, but I found it condemned me for the sins of my heart which I could not possibly prevent. I was extremely loath to give out, and own my own utter helplessness, but after repeated disappointments, though that, rather than perish, I could do a little more still, especially if such and such circumstances might but attend my endeavors. I hoped that I should strive more earnestly than ever, and this hope of future more favorable circumstances, and of doing something hereafter, kept me from utter despair of myself, and from seeing myself fallen in the hands of God, and dependent on nothing but boundless grace. 2. Another thing was that faith alone was the condition Footnote. The word condition is very alarming to the minds of some good people, but all that Mr. Brainerd meant by it, and many others who use it, is that there is no salvation without faith, and a footnote, of salvation, and that God would not come down to lower terms, that he would not promise life and salvation upon my sincere prayers and endeavors. That word, Mark 16, verse 16, he that believeth shall not be damned, cut off all hope there. And I found faith was the gift of God, that I could not get it of myself, and could not oblige God to bestow it upon me by any of my performances. 
Ephesians 2, verses 1 and 8. This, I was ready to say, is a hard saying, who can bear it? I could not bear that all I had done should stand for mere nothing, who had been very conscientious in duty, and had been exceedingly religious a great while, and had, as I thought, done much more than many others that had obtained mercy. I confessed indeed the vileness of my duties, but then what made them at that time seem vile was my wandering thoughts in them, not because I was all over defiled and the principle corrupt from whence they flowed, so that I could not possibly do anything that was good. And therefore I called what I did by the name of faithful endeavors, and could not bear it that God had made no promises of salvation to them. 3. Another thing was that I could not find out how to come to Christ. I read the calls of Christ, made to the weary and heavy laden, but could find no way that he directed them to come in. I thought I would gladly come if I knew how, though the path of duty directed to was never so difficult. Mr. Stoddard's guide to Christ did not tell me anything I could do that would bring me to Christ, but left me, as it were, with a great gulf between me and Christ, without any direction to get through. For I was not yet experimentally taught that there could be no way prescribed, whereby a natural man could, of his own strength, obtain that which is supernatural and which the highest angel cannot give. All this time the Spirit of God was powerfully at work with me, and I was inwardly pressed to relinquish all self-confidence, all hopes of ever helping myself by any means whatsoever, and the conviction of my lost estate was sometimes so clear that it was as if it had been declared to me in so many words, It is done. It is forever impossible to deliver yourself. For about three or four days my soul was thus distressed, especially at some turns, when, for a few moments, I seemed to myself lost and undone but then would shrink back immediately from the sight, because I dared not venture myself into the hands of God as wholly helpless. I dared not see that important truth, that I was dead in trespasses and sins. But when I had thrust away these views of myself at any time, I was distressed to have the same discoveries again, for I greatly feared being given over of God to final stupidity. When I thought of putting it off to a more convenient season, the conviction was so powerful with regard to the present time that it was the best time and probably the only time that i dared not to put it off yet my soul shrunk away from it i could see no safety in throwing myself into the hands of god and that i could lay no claim to anything better than damnation but after a considerable time spent in such distresses one morning while i was walking in a solitary place as usual i at once saw that all my contrivances to procure salvation for myself were utterly in vain i was brought quite to a stand as finding myself totally lost i had thought many times that the difficulties were very great but now i saw them in a very different light that it was forever impossible for me to do anything towards delivering myself I then thought of blaming myself, that I had not done more while I had an opportunity, for it seemed now as if the season of doing was forever over and gone. But I instantly saw that let me have done what I would, it would no more have tended to my helping myself than what I had done, that I had made all the pleas I ever could have made to all eternity, and that all my pleas were in vain. The tumult that had been before in my mind was now quieted, and I was something eased of that distress, which I felt while struggling against a sight of myself. I had the greatest certainty that my state was forever miserable for all that I could do, and was almost astonished that I had never been sensible of it before. In the time while I remained in this state, my notions respecting my duties were quite different from what I had entertained in times past. Now I saw there was no necessary connection between my prayers and the divine mercy that they laid not the least obligation upon God to bestow his grace upon me, and that there was no more goodness in them than there would be in my paddling in the water, which was the comparison I had then in my mind, and this because they were not performed from any love to God. I saw that I had heaped up my devotions before God, fasting, praying, etc., really thinking I was aiming at the glory of God, whereas I never once truly intended it. I continued in this state of mind from Friday morning till the Sabbath evening following, July 12, 1739, 
when I was walking again in the same solitary place and attempting to pray, but found no heart to engage in that or any other duty. Having been thus endeavoring to pray for near half an hour, and by this time the sun was about half an hour high, as I was walking in a dark thick grove, unspeakable glory seemed to open to the view of my soul. I do not mean any external brightness, nor any imagination of a body of light, or anything of that nature, but it was a new inward apprehension, or view, that I had of God, such as I never had before. I stood still and admired. I knew that I had never seen before anything comparable to it for excellency and beauty. It was widely different from all the conceptions that ever I had of God or things divine. I had no particular apprehension of any one person in the Trinity, either the Father, the Son, or the Holy Ghost, but it appeared to be divine glory that I then beheld, and my soul rejoiced with joy unspeakable to see such a glorious divine being, and I was inwardly pleased and satisfied that he should be God over all for ever and ever. My soul was so captivated and delighted with the excellency, loveliness, greatness, and other perfections of God that I was even swallowed up in him to that degree, that at first I scarce reflected there was such a creature as myself. Thus God, I trust, brought me to a hearty disposition to exalt him, and set him upon the throne, and ultimately to aim at his honor and glory as king of the universe. I continued in this state until near dark without any sensible abatement, and then began to think what I had seen, and was sweetly composed all the evening following. I felt myself in a new world, and everything about me appeared with a different aspect from what it was wont to do. At this time the way of salvation opened to me with such infinite wisdom, suitableness, and excellency that I wondered I should ever think of any other way of salvation, was amazed that I had not dropped my own contrivances and complied with this blessed and excellent way before. If I could have been saved by my own duties, or any other way that I had formerly contrived, my whole soul would now have refused. I wondered that the whole world did not see and comply with this way of salvation entirely by the righteousness of Christ. <laughs>